Hello, you are listening to the Bethel Atlanta Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. For more information about Bethel Atlanta, visit www.bethelatlanta.com. Thanks, guys. Oh, and thank you. Uh, there's a scripture for that. I don't think I'm in prison, though. Anyway, um, hi, everybody. How's it going? <laughs> Good. It's a little bit cooler in here with all this uh, piping stuff going on in the fans. Yes? No? <laughs> yes? Maybe? Awesome. So um, I have a, I'm excited to share with you what I want to what talk about today. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive in head first so that we can get into everything. Um, so for those of you who have been around, maybe the first little section of this might be familiar. Um, for those of you who are new, uh, Surprise. Um, so part of, part of my testimony is that I've, um, since I was a little kid, I've seen the spirit. So I've seen angels, demons, and other spiritual things uh, for my whole life. And um, actually, before I dive in too much, I wanted to share just a little bit about some stuff that I saw going on in worship today, if that's, if that's okay with you guys. <laughs> sounds like you're not that excited, so I don't need to. <laughs> no. Um, so I, I always say this, and I'll keep saying this, because honestly, I'm impressed by it still, um, even as a person who's grown up in church and grown up as a pastor's kid and missionary kid my whole life and been in tons and tons of services. I'm so impressed in how, at how much intentionality and purposefulness heaven puts into responding to the praise of God's people, that there's preparation, that angels are here while the band is practicing, while setup is going, and they're, they're investing in what we're doing here. And so I just love seeing that. And so as I was walking by to go to our morning meeting, I just saw angels moving in and out of the tent, you know, just, just preparing the way. And it was really cool. And I, 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 at, there was this kind of consistent theme throughout all of worship where um, as we started entering worship, I just saw this, this, the best way I can describe it is like this white liquid gold pouring into the room. And as we just began to worship, it just filled up, filled up, filled up over the course of the first song. And it filled up to where it was, you know, really high up in the uh, the non-rafters. Um, and um, and then as we get into the second song, it was it was interesting. So and, and this is just something that um, hit me. It was like it was so full in here. I'm like, oh, there's there. It's like almost overflowing. It's almost too full. And as we went into the second song, all of that 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 golden liquid. Um, just started getting absorbed by everyone. It was like everyone was sucking it in and absorbing it. And as it was happening, I had this thought of, you know, if you just think in terms of volume, there's too much in here to fit amongst all the people. But it was like it was just going in and going in and going in. And then as we went into the uh, next song, the room filled up again with this white gold liquid. And then again, it was like everyone absorbed it in again, and just absorbing this in. I thought... Oh, this is interesting. And as we went into that last set there, that last little kind of uh, just, just uh, you know, spontaneous set of worship, I just saw this, this golden cloud erupt out of everyone. It was just rocketing up. And it, it, it immediately just evoked this feeling of, of, you know, incense being burned on the altar, of sacrifice being burned on the altar in, in, in you know, the, the uh, history, history of the Israelites. I just had this picture of this high praise going up and just being released out. And I, it's one of the things, I, and I, again, I don't know how this works all the time, but it almost feels like when we engage with worship, when we engage with worship together, it's like our capacity to worship him goes up higher. Like I feel lifted into a higher place of worship by being in a community of people that's worshiping. And I just saw it getting released into the area. And it's funny because it has some, some of what to do with what I want to talk about today, which is that as I was watching just this, this and this is the thing that was fascinating, is that the, the volume of this cloud that was being released out was greater than the sum of the two things that had already been deposited, if that makes sense. It was like exponential growth. And as I saw that, I just felt like I heard the Holy Spirit say, you have no idea what this does for your city. You have no idea what this does for your city. So, so that was cool. Um, so again, for those of you who have been around a while, you've, I sh share stories about what I see relatively frequently. Um, and I want to talk about something I don't talk about all the time, 
uh, which is demons. <laughs> Significantly fewer claps on that than the last few times, but that's okay. Um, before anyone makes a, a run for it, I, I, um, so I'm just going to give you a really quick background. So I, I've been seeing the spirits for as long as I can remember since I was a little kid. And it wasn't until I was 12 years old that I got in, into an environment that really taught about the gifts of the spirit and the prophetic and things like that. So that was the first time I ever had a real context for the things that I was experiencing. And the first time that I really started trying to use this gift that God had given me. And so I started out real simple, you know, I'd 12, 13 years old to be sharing with the pastor what I saw happening while he was preaching or share with the worship team what I saw during worship and that encouraged people and seemed to bless them and things like that. And so I did that for a few weeks and then after a bit I thought, well, you know, I've been sharing about the angels I've been seeing, I've been sharing about the presence of God, how it's moving around. I do see all this demonic stuff too. I should probably figure out like what to do with that, you know, right? Mm -hmm got a gift, you should use it. Um, so I remember I was like, okay, you know, I just gotta, just gotta get used to it. You know, I just gotta give it a, give it a try. And so I was 13 years old, uh, sitting in the front of the church and I'm like, okay, um, I, you know, I'll start small. I'll, I'll look for someone who's got like some kind of demonic thing trying to bother them and I'll just let them know what's up, try to help them out a little bit, you know? Um, <laughs> and so I turn around, I'm like, eeny, meeny, miny, mom. And I'm getting, you know, nervous. I'm, I, I, was, I was always kind of a, like a, uh, you know, a little bit of an introvert, you know, socially awkward kind of kid. So I'm getting nervous just to have to talk to a person. So I'm like, all right, I'm just going to pick someone and go for it. And so I saw this guy hanging around in the back and walked in. Like, I know him a little bit. And so I walked back there. And I look at what's going on. You know, I see this, this uh, little, little demon hanging out over his shoulder. And I kind of asked the Holy Spirit what, what's that, what that is. And so I walk up and I'm like, I don't want to just tell him something's there. I want to, like, give him something that will help him, you know, like a solution to this, this you know, thing. That, that seems helpful, right? Yeah. So I'm 13 years old. This guy's, like, 45. I walk up to this guy, and I'm like, I should just be real straight, too. I should just cut to the chase. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to stretch it out. And so I, so I walk up to him and said, hey, I couldn't help but notice that you had a... a demon on your shoulder, <laughs> and I, I think that maybe you should stop looking at pornography. <laughs> well, and you know, this was just back at, at the back of the church with like however many people, you know, just there, and it wasn't like with an audience or anything, but... I, you know, his face turned, he went from like, uh, like sincere, let me give this young child attention to confusion to three or four shades of red. <laughs> and then he yelled at me for a while and left. <laughs> and so I thought, well, that didn't seem to work. Um, so I, a couple weeks went by and I'm like, I gotta be, I gotta say something. You know, why would I be seeing this stuff? I wasn't supposed to say something about it, right? And so... Okay, um, this time I'm going to a lady because that was scary. So I went to this lady, and I just saw this, you know, this fear thing that was trying to trying to get a hold of her, trying to take over her thought life. And so I walk up to her and just say, hey, I just noticed this. She started crying. And I'm like, okay, that's okay. You know, give someone a spiritual thing. They start crying. That's a good thing, right? And so I keep going, and then it transitions from, like, the good cry to the bad cry. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I'll just keep talking and see what happens. And... And then I'm, like, trying to say, oh, it's not that big of a deal, really. I mean, I think, you know, if you could just let go of the... And then she kept crying and then walked away. <sighs> so I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't know how to do this, you know. And so another several weeks went by. And, and, you know, people in the church knew a little bit that I saw in the spirit. And so this one friend of mine, he was a couple years older than me in the youth group. And he said, Blake, you got to tell me if there's some kind of d demon on me. You got to tell me. You just got to tell me. I'm like... This didn't work the last couple times, so I, I'm not going to do that. And he said, you just got to tell me. I can handle it, man. I can handle it. It's no problem. <laughs> I've heard that many times. <laughs> um, and then I look. I saw this little, you know, demonic thing kind of hanging out behind him, and I describe it, and he's like, I knew it. <laughs> and then he just kind of walked away <laughs> and wouldn't talk to me ever again. <laughs> And, and like, had this terrified look anytime I was in the room. 
And so after eight or nine of those, I was like, I'm just, this doesn't help anyone. No, this doesn't help anyone. This is not useful. So why would I share this at all? And, and for years I committed to, I'm just never talking about this because this does not help people. Um, well, it's, it's been a while since then. Um, and so we're just going to start on this end and work it out. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, so, the the I always did feel like I was neglecting part of my gifting by not talking about it. But every time I tried to, it was almost a complete disaster. And so I went into the mode that I usually do when things keep being a disaster, which is just to observe and see what's going on. And so. Um, I, what I wanted to do today is kind of in a simple sort of format, I just want to share you some of the things that I've noticed over the last 20 so years of just spying on all of you. Um, <laughs> I'm making an well about this stuff. Because I think that there's some things that we understand well about this stuff, and there's some stuff that's so simple that we could, that... We just seem to miss for whatever reason. And I, I mentioned this last week, and it's still, or two weeks ago, and it's still true this week, that I, I don't hate very many things, but one of the things that I do hate is any one of us missing out on anything that God has, has given us, anything that God has made available to us. And so for that reason, I, I do want to share some of this. And um, I think, I think it might, this time it actually might be helpful. Um, so real quick, I just want, uh, I want this scripture to be the, the kind of keynote, the, the background, the, the foundation of what we're talking about here. So, and this one's a good one, so you can turn to it and just kind of keep, keep this one handy. It's Luke 10. And this is Jesus sending out the 72, so he's, he's sending, you know, sending them out to go you know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, you know, and he's, he sends them out with authority. They go, and they come back, and they're like, Oh, this was awesome. And uh, it's, uh, let me see. It's, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll go uh, cha Luke chapter 10, verse uh, 17. So the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. That's how I imagine they say it. Um, <laughs> very excited. Uh, he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And I love this because it sets a very clear priority list. You know, it's, it's yeah, that's, that's awesome. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw the, the kings of darkness crumble. That is awesome. That is so exciting. But the best part is you get to be with me forever. That, that your name is written down, that you have been chosen, that we are in a relationship. That is the main thing we're doing here, and that's the main thing we're releasing here. And so I want to set that precedent. You know, it's the other precedent I want to set with this is I almost take this as like, hey, d d you know, that's awesome. That's exciting. Don't, don't stress it too much. That's standard. That is normal. Nothing will harm you. That, this, is, this is just what comes with being associated with the king of all kings, is that this just comes with it. You know, I... In my cheesy little brain, if I like transfer transfer this information to like automotive sales, it'd be like, you know, do not rejoice in your automatic transmission and power windows. That comes standard on all of our vehicles, <laughs> you know. But be excited that you have leather seats and quality air conditioning. No, I, you know, it's it's, but it's true in the sense that like this this is a fundamental part of. Being in, adopted into God's kingdom is that that stuff can't harm you. He just explains it almost casually, you know? And so now with a quick show of hands, um, like how many of you at some point in your life have felt under it, like felt attacked by the enemy at, at some point or another? Yeah, and I would, I would say that too. That seems like it's against the rules. And so I want to talk just about a couple of the things that I've seen that, that caused that. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ways that the enemy tries to a attack people, but w the three main categories that I've broken it down to, just in, this is the Blake Healy interpretation of demonic activity, um, is they, they try to bait people, 
They try to burden people, and then they just release lies on people. Now, most of all of what demons do is lie, but I feel like this is an important uh, separation here because a lot of times what the enemy will try to do is use the truth to tell a lie, is use, or even better, use a fact to tell a lie. Um, and also, it's important to know that sometimes he will use the truth to tell lies. Sometimes it's just an out-and-out out lie. Sometimes there's no truth in it whatsoever. It's important to know the difference between those two. Just FYI, but we'll get to that. Um, I'm going to give a, a short breakdown of that, and then we're going to just kind of dive into kind of what we can do to combat this. Um, um, but uh, And we'll get into more of the understanding of how that works as we get into it. But the, when the enemy tries to bait you, that's when he tries to take something that's happening, take a situation, and try to get you either emotionally invested or or focused on something that just doesn't, that either you don't have the authority to actually change or that you uh, aren't even necessarily meant to focus on whatsoever. So this can come a lot of different ways. This can be, hey, the pastor walks by you in the hall and doesn't say hi. Not that we have halls here, but um, <laughs> the, he walks past you in the field <laughs> and doesn't say and doesn't say hi, and the bait is, oh, he doesn't like you. <laughs> or whether, it, maybe it's not a pastor, maybe it's a friend, it's like, oh, she doesn't like you. She was annoyed by that thing that you said. He was annoyed by that thing that you said. He heard this about you. He believes this about you. He doesn't even care that you're here. He doesn't even re recognize you. He doesn't even know your name. You've been coming here for five years, and this person's never even met you before. How could that be? <laughs> Those may be true statements, and there may be true things that we need to work through or that we need to forgive or that we need to communicate in that, but it's so important when the enemy is trying to bait us. I, there have been times that I've been hurt by people, uh, that where my heart has been hurt towards someone, where I've been offended, where, I've been, where pain has been caused towards me, where I can feel the enemy just throwing out the bait one after the other and again you can do this the way you want to the way that I do it is I refuse to even process or engage with that idea until I feel the Holy Spirit bringing it to me I recognize that this is something I need to deal with this is something I need to address I'm not pushing this under the rug because that's that's causes other problems a bunch of bait underneath the rug that just causes cockroaches um the I'm not pushing this under the rug, but I'm not engaging with this until the Holy Spirit brings it to me. And I'm willing to wait patiently, even if I have to lay awake at night for three hours, pushing the, my natural need to process this out of my mind again and again and again. It's important because even if there is a true, real thing that someone did, even if it, someone actively did something negative towards you, actively did something that hurt you, if the enemy is bringing it to you to process, you can guarantee he is baiting you into walking the most painful, the most, the most ineffective, the, the slowest path to that solution, even if there is a genuine need and solution involved with it. Does that make sense? So don't let yourself be baited by the enemy because it sucks. Um, burden. The enemy will try to burden you. The enemy will try to load you up with false responsibility or a false version of your real responsibility. Does that make sense? Oh, man, if you have kids or a spouse or any other human that you're associated with, this happens a lot. Um, so I, I, I love my wife more than I love any other human being on the planet. And one of the things I loved about her most is that she's just really straightforward. She's really direct. She'll just tell you what she's thinking without, without any, almost no reservation whatsoever. Um, one of the things that as I, we got married and I started tying my life to this person was that I was suddenly very terrified that my wife just said what she thought and to just tell the truth. I'm like, oh, yeah, I love it when you tell me the truth. I love it when I just know I am with you. When, when you just tell that person the truth, that feels terrifying, and, and I feel embarrassed, and I feel like, ah, this panic, and I'm like, shh, 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 you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that sound. I feel that sound in here. And this uh, one year, two years in, I would, uh, you know, start to just, uh, like, oh, this social interaction in this, in this group of people that I'm getting to know is going great. And then April would start talking, and I'd feel the, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. 
Oh, no. <laughs> and, and then I heard the Holy Spirit say, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, I think I'm panicking. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, how people perceive April, how people resp- and if you hold on about April, it's not your responsibility, even though you are her husband. And if you hold on to that responsibility that you have literally zero control over, then you are hurting yourself. And you're not experiencing one of the things that made you fall in love with her. And I realized that as I step back of like, okay, I'm not, it's okay if, if April says something that even embarrasses herself or, or something that confuses someone or someone who, anyway. Um, and I found this ability to celebrate who she was again and even better to recognize when, hey, honey, that was not something that I wanted to share about me with other people. You know, I could actually have the boundaries with her saying that, Hey, I, I, I love you being you, but I don't want you to be open about that thing that with me, with other people. Does that make sense? Because that, that one was mine. Oh, that is my, my thing that I don't want you to share, you know? And um, <laughs> like telling random people on the plane that her husband sees angels, you know, that's <laughs> <laughs> makes for an interesting flight. <laughs> um, especially when you just happen to be wearing a Ghostbuster shirt that day. Um, <laughs> What a wonderful series of events. Anyway, um, so, but letting go of the false responsibility of the burden of it actually freed me up to appreciate and to actually recognize what I needed. Does that, does that make sense? To actually hear the Holy Spirit walk me through, oh yeah, it does make me feel scared when this happens, you know? Um, the, other, the other types of burdens they'll, they'll have is, Okay, I'm just going to throw this out there, so I'm sorry. But, like, you know, you're not responsible for what other Christians decide to do. You're not responsible for what uh, this person decides to do, that person decides to do. You're only responsible a certain percentage of what your country decides to do. You know what I mean? That do- uh, here we go. Um, <laughs> That doesn't mean you have zero responsibility. That doesn't mean you ignore. That doesn't mean you push things under the rug. It means don't let the enemy put a burden on you. Recognize the burden that God is putting on you. Does that make sense? There is a responsibility. There is a response. There is that. But, man, if we get, if we're responding to what the enemy is saying, we're running in circles. I had this good friend of mine. I This person was struggling with really being upset at a situation. It was a church situation, not this church, different church. And he was just going around and around. Should I say something? Should I not say something? Should I do this? Should I do that? Why didn't this? Why didn't that? Why? And just over and over and over. And I looked in the spirit and there's this demon standing behind him with this like horrible farce of a uh, like game show board, like the Price is Right or something. And I see a picture of his heart, like a little like caricature of his heart, and it's running through this maze. And this maze is just going. It's this teeny tiny little intricate maze over and over and over and over and over. And I was like, what's going on? I step back and I look and I ask the Holy Spirit, what's going on? And the Holy Spirit says, where's the exit? And I looked and it's this maze with no exits. It's just this maze that was su- super intricate, lots of work, plenty to do. But it just goes forever, over and over and over again. We need to be willing to set down our genuine need to process responsibility, things that we need to respond to. We need to be willing to set down our need to process even real things that we need to process. Because if we do it the enemy's way, if we choose to walk the path that he's baiting us into, he's leading us into, we're running in a maze with no exits. And then we get exhausted, frustrated, and start resenting the entire situation. Does that make sense? Yeah. God has the straight and narrow path. The enemy has the infinite maze. Um, the other one is just out and out lies. This is so important to recognize. Yes, the enemy will throw truth at you in a twisted way. Sometimes he just fabricates things. This is a harsh one, but it's one that comes to mind. I have a, one of my closest friends uh, growing up. He was an amazingly anointed worship leader, still, still is, and just a really, really gifted person, 
and just lo- one of those people, you know, that just has like such as a tender heart towards the Lord, just one of those like tender hearted, loving people. And the enemy just told him this lie from when he was very young. You're not, children aren't safe around you. Children aren't safe around you. Children aren't safe around you. You can't be trusted with children over and over and over and over again. And he would start, to, he would like stay away from kids because he's just was believing this lie over and over and over again. You're not safe around children. You're not safe around children. And, as, and it wasn't until he, he got married and he and his wife just talked about this, this lie that had just been built up over and over again of like, that is not who you are. And this wasn't the only area. He, uh, this guy was a, a strong prophetic person as well. And everyone would, and the enemy would just keep throwing this lie, like you're trying to manipulate that person. You're trying to trick that person. You're, you're um, you know, you're just doing this. Oh, this is just you. Just these lies over and over and over again. That wasn't something that he needed to process. That wasn't something he needed to work through. That was a lie. That was a complete and utter fabrication that the enemy was throwing at us, at, at him. Um, one thing I'll say to him, we'll, we'll get into more of this in just, just a sec here. People make the mistake of thinking of the spirit. Yeah, when we're in worship, we can feel the presence get close. And, oh, yeah, the veil's really thin now. You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, the spirit realm is just, a mu- just as much a part of creation as anything else. This is something that God created that you are built fundamentally to operate in at all times, 24-7. It is integrated with one another. And it's important for us to, to remember that because if we ignore that, we can forget that what we, what we do and how that, that, that those things are so closely related. Does that, does that make sense to you guys? Because um, with that, I, I want to start explaining what we, the number one things that I see that people miss with regard to how to war against these things. Um, my, my list here is, you know, a lot, there's a lot of things I'm not going to mention here that are totally awesome and valid. Prayer, yes, that totally works. That is Im- so important. Just praying, praying against when we feel attacked, you know, just releasing heaven on, in areas that we, that we don't see things working or we just feel, feel the enemy trying to mess with things. Releasing prayer, totally valid. Just going into worship and just, and just letting it all go and just worshiping God, totally valid, so important. I, I'm not addressing those as directly today just because those are ones that, pe- in my experience, people tend to think of or tend to, you know, be ready at hand. Yes? Yeah. I want to address some of the things that I see people missing or forgetting that are deep, free, integrated in your ability to live free of the, all, of these, all of this bait, all of, this, all of these tricks of the enemy. Because what I see here again, is I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all power, all power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Those are two definitive all and nothing words. He kind of even addressed, oh yeah, that's, uh, I saw Satan fall like lightning. That's awesome. That's great. Hey, this other stuff's way cooler, (laughs) you know? But yes, this is, you're totally covered. I think these are these few things I'm going to bring up are the things that I see causing us to miss on that promise. Does that make sense? Numero uno on my scale is rest. 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 The God of the universe, the the only unlimited power that exists created everything, and then took a break, took a breather, took a day off. He was modeling something that's fundamental to our needs, fundamental to our design, our intended design. We need rest. Crashing at the end of a long day is not resting. That's emergency shutdown mode. (laughs) That's going from negative back to zero, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's finally paying off all your credit cards so that you can fill them all up again, you know? It's, it's that. <laughs> no. Um, the <laughs> I've done that before. Um, the <sighs> cr- 
crashing in front of the TV. I don't really think there's necessarily anything inherently wrong with watching TV, but you know what I'm talking about. Crashing, oh, I just want to watch something that's just going to make me feel good, like, you know. I'm going to watch the Great British Breaking Show all day. <laughs> They're so polite. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, I love the Great British Breaking Show. It's on Netflix. It's a great show. It's very relaxing. But I, I felt the difference between I watched that show and I'm engaged and I'm resting, enjoying it, versus like I'm just crashing out and watching this box because it's not time to go to sleep yet. You, you know what I'm saying? We need rest. We need rest peace in our lives. And in the culture that we're in now, it, not for a bad reason, I think, but because we have so much opportunity. We have so much opportunity to give our attention to so many things, so many awesome things, so many terrible things, but so many awesome things too, um, that we have to choose to make rest happen. You know, there were times that the structure of our environment would create automatic rest. You know, hey, it gets dark at a certain point and you can't work anymore or you're going to cut your foot off with the hoe, you know. It's not going to work anymore. <laughs> Is this how you use a hoe? I don't, I'm a wonderful gardener. Anyway, um, <laughs> podcast people be grateful you didn't see that. Um, the... I'll say this, uh, so we, we've hear, we hear all these things about like how uh, people aren't really good at multitasking, so stop multitasking, it's not good for you. Let me, let me just give you guys a science experiment real quick. You guys want to do a science experiment real fast? Cool. Count to 10 in your head. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Boom. That wasn't in my head, but I got the microphone. So you can count to 10 pretty fast in your head, yeah? Do the entire alphabet in your head as fast as you can. Hey, we see the And before we say that, how many of you sung the song in your head really fast? <laughs> I do every time, even if I don't start that way. Um, so now, instead, alternate between the two. 1A, 2B, 3C, and see how fast you can do that in your head without missing one. <laughs> Takes longer, huh? Feels a little bit more frantic, though. <laughs> That's how your brain is designed to work. Your brain is designed to focus on something and build all and see all the elements that are related to that thing and do it really, really quickly. But if you switch back and forth like that, it feels like you're going really fast. But you're actually going way slower and working way harder. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Science. <laughs> um, this is one of those bait things that can happen of, in our culture of high achievers and getting stuff done and making things happen, we can be baited into running in circles along a pathway. <laughs> Where, yeah, you're making it in a direction, but you're kind of spinning around like a whirling dervish as you go, you know. Um, and it's way, way, way more work. You can get baited into, well, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. I got to make sure to do this. I got to make sure to do that. And hopping between these things and it feeling like you're doing it faster, but you're literally exhausting yourself more. These things are integrated into the way we operate in the spirit. Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Rest is part of the promise of heaven over and over and over and over. It's part of the promise of God's kingdom all throughout the Psalms, all throughout the scripture, at both Testaments, all the time. Rest is part of the gift of God for your life. And if we are missing out on that, we are missing out on part of his kingdom. Does that make sense? These are the things that will make you immune to the attacks of the enemy. When you're exhausted, all of a sudden that bait looks really good. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to fix it. Oh, I'm going to solve that problem. Oh, I'm going to be able to do that for 30 miles in a circle, you know? If we're rested, we can actually think more clearly. If we're focused, we can recognize what fits and what doesn't fit into our life. Does that make sense? A1, B2, 3C. It's really hard. Um, next up on the list is fun. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> We like fun. We sure do. <laughs> You're designed to need play 
in your life. You're designed to need fun in your life. Um, I hope I don't get the author's name wrong, but there's this wonderful book by, I believe it's Stuart Brown, called Play. And a really good book, not necessarily from a Christian perspective, but fun science stuff in there. Um, and it's basically just a scientific study about how we are, again, fundamentally designed to need to have fun, to play. To Now, uh, his definition of play, which I think is a very, very good one, is doing some th- spending time doing something only for the sake of doing it. Only for the sake of doing that thing. I am not walking so that I can burn calories. I am not, uh, you know, doing this thing so that I can work on my PhD or doing this extracurricular activity because it looks good on college uh, transfer papers and things like that, you know. That doesn't mean you're not, you can't have fun in those things, but true, pure fun, true play is I'm just doing this because I enjoy doing this. This activity brings me joy, and I'm doing it for the sake of doing it. Now, what happens when we get into that state of just doing this thing for the sake of doing it? Well, um, the enemy shows up with that false responsibility that I told you about, those burdens, sets on your shoulders and say, man, you could be getting so much done right now. Oh, man, I can't believe you're ignoring that. (laughs) Oh, man, did you know that so-and-so has already written three books? And I could, oh, man, in the time I've spent doing this, I could have learned how to speak Japanese, how to crochet, and how to fly an airplane, and I'm sitting here doing this. Now, all you high achievers out there who are building those beautiful arguments in your head against me right now, that's it's not to say that it's impossible for you to, to overindulge, to just do things, you know, that, to become idle and unhealthy. But you are designed to have fun, to play. God gave his chosen people a series of laws that included multiple celebrations throughout the year. A mandatory day of rest. <laughs> there, there, there are festivals. When you read about the, the all the different um, Hebrew Hebrew uh, holidays, some of it's like, yeah, this one we just eat all day, <laughs> and then the next day we eat again, <laughs> and you just have fun and hang out with people and eat and rest. <laughs> um, in that book, play, he talks about how they've done studies, or they've you know run studies on. Uh, wolf packs, where if a, uh, a wolf, th- th- there was this one situation where they had a wolf that um, had been injured, and so they took it into a care facility to you know, nurse it back to health, and then they brought it back into the pack. And it was having this um, unhealthy, like uh, in wolf terms, like um, antisocial behavior, like not integrating in the, in the pack, not, not he, he was mu- this wolf was much more likely to interpret just different information as an attack or as a threat than when it was just kind of communication or, or things like that. They, they were trying to figure it out over and over and over and what's gone. They realized that this wolf did not play as a pup with other, with other uh, wolf pups. So it didn't learn healthy boundaries. It didn't learn how to be integrated into a group. And it resulted in it being defensive, a loner, and um, it actually not, not knowing how to behave around other things. Like we are... All creatures, big and small, need to be able to play, to have fun. Does that make sense? The, the next one that I have, and I'm going to start wrapping up here, is, this is a big one for me, friends. You need friends. People who know you and whom you know. Working next to other human beings doesn't automatically count. (laughs) Seeing a bunch of people throughout the day doesn't necessarily automatically count. I'm going to say something in an unnecessarily controversial way. What was the first mistake that God ever made? Made all of creation, made all the animals, made Adam, made a man in his own image. Whoops, no suitable mate was found. What an oversight. What a, what, what a thing to forget. I don't think God made a mistake. I think he wanted to very clearly underline a fundamental aspect of his design for humanity, that it is not good that man should be alone. That doesn't just mean go find a wife or go find a husband. It means that you need a community. You need friends. Let me just nail this a little bit harder. Jesus, the Son of God, 
had multiple layers of friends. He had the 72. He had, he had smaller groups within that. He had the 12. He had the three that he was closest with. And he had the one. He had John, who was his closest friend. Jesus himself modeled all this stuff I'm talking about, actually. He modeled rest. He modeled fun. He modeled all these things. His first miracle was turning water into wine. Jesus modeled fun. <laughs> Um, it's so easy to think of these things as secondary, to think, think of these things. I cannot count on all of my hands and all of my, oh, both of my hands, and uh, <laughs> I meant to say all of my fingers, all of my fingers and all of my toes. I cannot count the number of people who have come up to me who are racked with demonic torment, nightly, daily, fear, anxiety, torment. And I ask them three questions. <laughs> What do you do for fun? What, who are your friends? How much rest do you get? Inevitably, all or one or two of those are lacking. Inevitably, there is no case I have encountered in hundreds of people who are under demonic torment if these three factors are not present. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll be a little extra blunt. And then I tell them that, and they're like, you didn't give me a magical seeing the spirit answer to this question. <laughs> They usually say it a little bit nicer than that, but um, you, if, if these things are not present in, your, present in your life, you will experience effects. I'm not trying to prophesy something negative. I'm saying if you don't eat food, you'll die eventually. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not trying to curse something. I'm, I'm talking about your design, your fundamental design, that if you do not have all these things or find out how to build these things and take responsibility for creating these things in your life, if you just look for your community or your society to create these things, sometimes that will work, but then sometimes it won't. And then you'll be subject to the effects of your environment rather than subject to what God made available in your life. Does that make sense? Um... All right, everyone, everyone stand up real quick. I just want to pray for you on, on these things. It, it may sound strange uh, to hear me as a young kid just walking up and saying that stuff to people, you know, and you might think, well, that's harsh. Wow. You were stressed out by what April said about truth, you know. Um, <laughs> I was so surprised that people were so hurt or scared or, or bothered by the demonic stuff that I saw on them. Because when you see that stuff in the spirit, when you really discern what's going on, you've been given a new identity in Christ. That stuff's not associated with you anymore. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, it, it's incorrect. It doesn't fit. It's like, oh, that's not you. That's not who you are. That doesn't mean you don't have responsibility. That doesn't mean you don't make choices. That doesn't mean that, that our choices can sometimes make room for that stuff. But that, no matter what you do, your identity is still found in Christ. <laughs> and you have the ability through grace to change what you do, to change those choices, to change those things of an ability that you wouldn't have without him. And that's one thing I want to integrate into this is it's one thing to read a cool book about, ah, play, cool. I'm going to invite some folks over. We're going to play some cards. That'll be great, you know, and, which is a good idea. Yeah, that's, that's friends and resting and uh, play all together. But um, we, we need the Holy Spirit to make the actual transformations that are, that are needed in our lives. It's great. We can't do it on our own. And that's so good because we need his help. We, because if we could do it on our own, then we would just create another program, create another regimen, create a, a formula that would work for some people and not work for other people. But we have the Holy Spirit, and this is our inheritance. This is part of heaven. All the things that I listed are things that are, desc that are described in the kingdom of God. Rest, peace, joy forevermore. Intimacy, adoption, family, these are the things that are promised. And if we are not experiencing those, then we need to be willing to take responsibility 
from moving towards what God has for us. He'll make the way. He'll reveal the people. He'll show us all those things, and he'll make it uh, easy for us. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Some of us don't feel that. Some of us have been in ministry in our, his, in our history. When I tell people I'm in full-time ministry, they're like, ooh, that's a, that's a thing. And I'm like, I thought his yoke was easy and his burden was light. If you're not experiencing that, then you might have the wrong yoke on. I'm serious. There's promises about what it's like to be with God. And if we're not living that, then I do not want to live under the enemy's or my own standard of goodness and glory and peace and rest. I want to live under heaven's standard. So just put your hands out in front of you. Lord, we just invite heaven into this room. We invite truth into this room. We invite, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, we invite correction. Even if it's correction about having more fun, even if it's correction about resting more, that it wouldn't be that, it, we wouldn't, again, take that false build, and work on this now, and that false bait of being, feeling beat down by correction, or that, oh, I just got to work on this now, I got to work on this now, and turn all of a sudden resting into an achievement that we have to get. Lord, show us what you're saying. Show us what you're making available. Show us how your yoke is easy and that your burden is light. Show us how to engage with what you have for us to carry. Yes, there is responsibility. Yes, there is response necessary, but there is joy forevermore. I just say right now for every person in this, in this room that there is nothing that can cause any of us to miss out on one penny of the inheritance that Jesus won for us. That anything that gets in, that, in the way of that would be so apparent and so easy to change that we would just move directly into our identity as true sons and true daughters in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Sermon of the Week. To stay connected with Bethel Atlanta, visit www.bethelatlanta.com.